but yeah, I mean, for me having those two different things, um, you know, when they're both firing and going well, I mean, it's, you're on top of the world and, um, and when there are those weeks and it, and it just is that way where they're both just very much, you know, it's harder. It's, you're going through a hard period. It, 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 yeah, it, it takes a lot of energy to, to roll out of bed then, you know, that morning and, and, you know, go back and try to make it better. But, um, you know, the composing is such an emotional roller coaster by itself anyway, that if anything, it's taught me to recognize that, if you're having that bad day, it's not going to stay that way. You, you know, I, I at least am able to know now that it, you know, things don't always go down. They, they have to go back up at some point too. And so, uh, so that's been really helpful too. Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. With me today is Tyler Grant. Tyler, how's it going? It's great. How are you, Robbie? I'm awesome. I think the last time we spoke at length was like when you were just starting out at your current teaching job. Is that right? Yes. I think it was right before I accepted the uh, teaching job here at, uh, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia at Holy Innocence Episcopal School. I'm the director of bands, uh, specifically lead teach the the middle school band and, and the high school band classes, um, as well as co-teach some of our elementary band classes, fourth and fifth grade beginners. That's awesome. And right before we started officially recording we were just like starting to get into some of the covid stuff because i i have had uh, just so many people on recently who are doing lots of interesting things with online teaching models but you are you are in person and a hybrid model and we were getting into that so i thought it might be interesting why not just jump right in and start there what what is teaching looking like for you right now Absolutely. Well, we've been uh, in the hybrid model ever since the beginning of the academic year. So back in August is when we start our academic year. And for us, of course, the hybrid model is um, having in-person students or students that choose to or by uh, means of quarantine necessity uh, are uh, quarantined at home and zooming into the classrooms. And what's been interesting for our ensembles across our entire fine arts department is that there are certain classes like our, our orchestra program that have been able to adapt to this model very in a similar way. I won't say completely the same way that a lot of the other core classes um, are able to, but for, for wind instruments, of course, many people on here who are band directors know that uh, the aerosol studies that have been floating around this year have definitely caused some concern as to the safety of playing wind instruments. So um, we had to make the decision early this year, just for the safety of our students, that we would play only outside under an event tent. Hmm. Um, and what we discovered very quickly is that we actually don't get Wi-Fi under our event tent. And wow. so we've had to uh, really restructure our entire program uh, right at the beginning of the year and find a way to make this work. And it actually has worked out really great um, that two of my other colleagues, uh, our other band directors at school, are um, wonderful and we alternate having a director inside working with our remote learners on zoom and in many ways giving them uh, a private lesson or just a group lesson and working with them all in their ability-based classes uh, to to be able to keep them um, keep them going and it's also really great because of the COVID-19 situation that um, students come in and out of being remote learners fairly frequently our school is not one of the schools where you actually are required to uh, commit to um, an entire nine weeks or an entire semester as a remote learner. Uh, there are times when a student needs to come in and out. And so that's been great to keep our students engaged throughout the entire, um, the entire process if they happen to be out for a few weeks and then return. They don't really feel like they missed a whole lot. They've, they missed their friends at school, of course, but they also, at the same time, they didn't miss uh, any of the content because there was somebody there to teach them and give them adequate feedback over Zoom. So I'm finding that with my fully online situation that um, what is working the gosh, I'm going to I'm going to like really summarize this. We can break it down more later if we want. But I, what I'm finding is working is that that they just they want to play their instruments and mm -hmm. um we to make that work for them i've got just so much play along material queued up and i'm trying to have them feel like what they're doing is a rehearsal even if what i'm doing feels nothing like like i'm not hearing any of the same things i'm hearing um but if they're getting the sense of because you know because part of the benefit of the rehearsal every day is that 
you know, I mean, like we all know, we all know the tendencies of kids. Like there's a, there's a definite benefit to the rehearsal, just what, being a place where they're playing their instruments for 45 minutes a day. Like that, you know, that, and that's one of the reasons I try to talk as little as possible when I direct. Um, mm -hmm. And it's this, you know, like with teaching online, some of that is now like these play along tracks and, you know, we're doing some concert music, we're doing some scales and some exercises and some things, but um, you know, but they like that more than they like, really being too invested in these all these technology tools that are um you know where they're not they're not playing their instrument quite as much as they are actually like learning the tool so i'm curious like is that a, a similar piece of feedback you're getting from your online students and then how are you how are you reconciling that how are you making sure that because i imagine you want to play as much as possible with the kids who are in person um you know how are you reconciling those two different kinds of learning that are happening between the two band directors you know it's I think that's a, that's a magic question for a lot of us. That's kind of been on the, on the front of our minds. And, um, and you're right. Our students want to play so much and it, it really came down to finding is, you know, when I mentioned this tent earlier, um, even though our students are at times because of the wind or the heat or the cold at, you know, this time right now it's December of 2020 and it's it happens to be in the thirties degrees and, we can't go out to out to play that often. Yeah. So do you um, not, do you not have a heater out there? I was going to ask. Uh, uh, no, we we don't. And so okay. they're, they're at the at the moment, we, if we uh, if we don't have um, uh, at the moment, if the, if the weather is bad, we will just we'll stay inside, and we actually will do um, enrichment activities that are um, still music based, but they're also uh, very much uh, just stuff that still engages the students. And so we've, we've done units indoors on uh, pop music and we've done units on film music and music technology. Um, uh, planning next semester to get into garage band with them and, and do some garage band projects. Um, I actually last year was also uh, taught middle school music appreciation. And so I also happen to have a large uh, bag of tricks that I have uh, gained from there and a lot of curriculum developed that I think really engages the students in a positive way. And so um, so yeah, so we don't have uh, heating control outside, but you know, even with the weather sometimes being unpredictable, um, you know, if it's a day we can't play or if it's a day where it might be a little uncomfortable, but it's not unsafe for them to be outside, uh, they still love playing. They still love playing. They go outside and they're still very excited to be out there and, um, and they really enjoyed still having that experience. Uh, one tool for us that has been great to help reconcile these two things would actually be uh, smart music mm -hmm. and having an opportunity to still assign the repertoire to our students who are at home. And while playing along with a, an accompaniment track is certainly not the same thing as being in a live ensemble, it is right now for us the closest thing that we can achieve. And, um, you know, another method for that for some people, those who are able to play with their bands indoors, um, even the students that you can't give the feedback to immediately because they are on zoom and you're listening to the in-person students at the same time. Um, you know, they still are my, my good colleague, Elizabeth Lambach, who actually is the orchestra director at, at my school. She has her students playing along with her while she is teaching her orchestra class. And from what I can gather from her, you know, those students are, they have their headphones on and they are playing along and they're just excited to have music as a part of their day, even if they are at home. And so even if we don't fully achieve that ensemble feeling that we get, we had pre-COVID um, at the moment, I think that the students are still finding ways to, um, to remember what it's like and, and enough to hold them on to, to, for when we are able to play in the same room again. Yeah. I'm impressed so. at the amount of in, in the hybrid setting, which you've just described, like how much, how much flexibility you have to have as a person and as a teacher to, because it sounds like your approach is, you know, can change literally with the weather. Like if it's a little breezier and colder one day, you're thinking to yes. yourself, you know, cause for some people, like the idea of not stepping on the podium and waving a stick and doing concert music, like that is a major overhaul and like requires you to vastly rethink how you want to sequence your instruction. Um, but if you're on a daily basis deciding like, well, we're actually doing music appreciation today. We're, we're studying pop music. Like that's, um, uh, that's just requires such a, an incredible amount of flexibility. Yes, we I actually should mention that we uh, at the moment we are investigating possibilities on campus and venues on campus that we can bring our students inside and start playing. 
Um, and, and so we, we're, we, we're still in the middle of, of figuring that out, but we only recently have had the temperature drop for us. And so we, the majority of this semester has been fantastic um, and a, a really beautiful fall. And we have, we've been yeah. very blessed to not have to worry about it until the, just really the past two to three weeks. And, um, and so it, you're right. It did make me really rethink things. And, um, at the end of the day, you know, we can talk about how, difficult it is for us to play traditional repertoire and how difficult it is to be able to assess our students the same way if, if there are students that have been hybrid or uh, virtual all year versus students that maybe have been on campus all year and trying to create some kind of consistency between the two. Um, it's been my experience that as long as we are trying to teach our students to love music, then if that's the central concept that you're that we're always keeping in in check, then the other stuff we can fix later. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's very much, and, and, and it's very easy to say, and, and I know a lot of people listening might think that, um, you know, it, it sounds great in theory, but how do you actually execute that? I think we're all trying to figure that out for ourselves because if we really are honest, right now, band is not as, it's not as fun as it once was because we have all these other things we have to think about with our bell covers and with our playing masks and, um, you know, the trombone needs extra square footage when it plays apparently and all these different things that we're having to think about. Right. Um, and so, and so I, I think for our students to love music, they have to, if they love music, then they will hold on. At least most of them, I hope will hold on for the day that we can finally come back and, and play together. Yeah. I think everyone, especially who teaches at the age that we do, like, I think all of us are aware of, but maybe are reminded of in a different way this year how much our students love the social experience of being in a performing ensemble. Like I, the, the amount of emails in the first week or so of school I was getting where kids were super apprehensive about continuing and maybe wanted to quit or drop. Um, it became so clear how much the environment was, was a part of that. And, you know, you're talking about loving music. I think there's also something to be said for just loving the experience of the class, whatever you make that. And um, for my students, I'm asking myself, like, how do I make this experience something they love, even if it never looks like this again? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that what they need right now is uh, safety. They want to play, so they want to be creative. Um, they want to play their instruments. And, you know, I think that it's challenged me to definitely, I mean, I had, I had some de very, very high ambitions coming into the fall and I've like vastly rethought everything is I guess what I'm trying yes. to say. Yes. I think a lot of us, we came into this fall, I was telling a colleague this today, I think a lot of us came in and we had maybe three scenarios that we thought could, could happen. And, you know, scenario A, scenario B, scenario C, and then what ended up happening was scenario D that none of us really knew. And, and, um, and for everybody that that's a different definition, you know, and, um, and so, yeah, it, it's finding a way to make the experience as, as, you know, as enjoyable as possible. I remember back last last year, um, at the end of last academic year, um, right when we were finishing up the year uh, virtually, I was trying to find something and it was, it was the night of our concert and um, our students were very sad that they were not gonna get to play all the, the fun repertoire that we had picked out and, yep. and they were very disappointed about that. And I tried to think of something that, they, that we could do that would be just something for them to look forward to. And I have, I have a wonderful um, and very supportive administration and um, just wonderful educators, wonderful leaders at our school. And, uh, and so I, I called up our principal and a couple of our administrators and just said, told them to hop on a Zoom at, at seven o'clock one night. And we had a Zoom dance party. Um, and we had families that put their computers in their living rooms. Uh -huh. And uh, that, and I and I was the DJ from my you know home office, <laughs> and we we cranked the tunes, and we had our principal and our administrators and some teachers and the band directors. We had students dressed up. We had all kinds of amazing stuff, and uh, we met a lot of pets on <laughs> huh, <laughs> uh, yes. who were you know uh, and everything. But we had whole families that were taking part in this and doing all kinds of you know fun fun tunes and just dancing around for thirty to forty five minutes and. Um, and so I think all of us, that's just one example of, uh, but I, of course, stole that from another teacher. That was not my own original idea. And so I think at this point, the big thing for us to do is just collaborate with other teachers. And it's good to do when there's not a global pandemic, but especially now when we're trying to figure out how to make our kids engage and how to make them love music. 
And, um, and there are times when we don't feel like we have the answers and that's why we lean on other people. And that's, that's what's been able to get me through 2020 and gives me some hope and some plans for 2021 going into the next semester. Yeah. How, if you just had to like take a, a wild guess, um, do, do you feel like your school will be fully in person next fall? I, I think so. It, it's hard to tell um, at this point. It's, it's just really hard to tell. I mean, we've, uh, we've been, you know, we've, our school has been really wonderful about, um, about the safety at our school and uh, doing things as safely as possible. And so, um, you know, we will, we'll see what's, we'll see what happens, but I would say it looks like we probably would be, um, we're definitely making plans to be in, in person in the fall or in the spring. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the hot topics in my district right now is we're we're just really talking about recruitment, and it's taken, you know, the process has taken a whole entire new meaning when you know we have elementary school teachers who are really struggling with enrollment, and uh, you know, all across the board, all across even middle and and high school, we have students who were doing it and then who maybe dropped. Um, we're we're just seeing you know a lot of challenges in this area. Um, how do you see yourself managing next year? Like, do you do you have an idea how since you know, maybe, maybe like with, for these online students or, or maybe I shouldn't make assumptions, but I know for me, like, I, I just, I have a lot of less information about how my students play. And, you know, so it's really caused me and the other band director I work with to rethink how we're going to move everyone through our program and best plan for our program to, of course, sound great, but our program, we can, we can work with anything we have. We really also want to be conscious of like, how do we support our elementary schools enrollment and then make sure that kids are engaged in high school? What's that looking like for you? Well, that, that is, um, that is our, that is our discussion, not even about next year, but even as we navigate into the second semester too, uh, we're, we are worried about enrollment and, and re- retention in the program. And we actually, between the end of last year and this year, we did see a fairly significant growth, um, in the program. This is my second year as director of bands. And, um, and so we, we have been, actively trying to build the program. We've also seen a growth in our enrollment at our school, which is also helping. Yep. Um, and, you know, a, another point worth mentioning as well. But uh, I, I agree with you. It, there are students that um, I don't know as much about how they played simply because there's only so many hours in the day or, or so many minutes in the day to hear them on Zoom and also be working with other Zoom students and trying to give them valid and reliable assessment and really find out what what they're able to achieve. Also, for many of us, we've had to really pare down our curriculum quite a bit and realize that we're not going to achieve everything that we might normally achieve in an academic year. And so, you know, my, for me, with our, our current model, I was elated to get through, I think, our, our uh, five or six of the major scales with one of my middle school uh, ensembles today. As a matter of fact, I just came home right, from that right. class and that was, I'm over the moon about that. Um, and that was, you know, something that we were trying to aim for. Now, if you look at our concert repertoire and the, the um, both the quality and the quantity of pieces that we've been able to work through and the pacing of that, that has been drastically slower. And so, um, and so in looking towards next year, I'm also having to consider the repertoire and the grade levels that I'm picking and realizing that we're probably going to be a little bit, we're going to have to take a step back and work ourselves back up to some of the music that we were playing before the pandemic started. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to talk a little bit about composing, but I'm going to sort of pivot to it backwards by sort of connecting it, I think, to the classroom with a, with a question or two. I also, I also don't want to take for granted, like, my audience. Like, I, a lot of people who, like, drink band, like, know who you are like you you compose a lot of music for young band and i you know i, I don't want to take for granted the fact that, like there's probably like people who listen, you know there's people who listen to the show who teach all sorts of different content areas some who Absolutely. teach just electronic music some who teach orchestra uh some who Absolutely. teach choir like you you've been composing since you were very very young do you want to like if you i don't know what's the, like the um you're going in an elevator up with someone and you're giving someone like your br- abridged composing history what does that look like oh my goodness well okay so i am I started, I was, I took, I was a part of music programs uh, growing up, um, had a wonderful general music program at my elementary school that I was really interested in. That general music teacher actually saw how well I was doing in the general music class and told my parents that I really needed to do band. 
and that that was the place that I really belonged. And me being a not so smart fourth grader, I, I resisted that and said that, no, I didn't want to be in the band. And my parents and this teacher had enough wisdom to realize that sometimes our young, these young kids don't always know exactly what they want or what they need. Uh-huh. And so they told me to try it. They made me try it. And I'm glad that they did because I immediately fell in love with it. Um, I was a euphonium player growing up and all through college. And, um, and as far as composing, I started writing full band pieces by my fifth grade year. Um, by the time I got to my seventh grade year, midway through, I uh, had published my first composition. It was accepted for publication. It was in print my eighth grade year. And, um, and so that was published with FJH Music Company. Uh, the band and orchestra folks will recognize the name Brian Belmagus. He is uh, I, probably my biggest composition mentor uh, and teacher. He's the one who, um, uh, who published me at that very early age. And so ever since 2009, I've been writing music with uh, the FJH Music Company, uh, writing music for middle and high school bands, and have recently branched into more uh, collegiate level pieces as well. I've also started my own publishing company and have self-published a lot of works as well. Um, and I uh, had the chance to have my music played at the Midwest Clinic and various uh, all-state groups and state conferences and Carnegie Hall. Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade as of um, about 10 years ago as well. And so um, it's, it's been a very interesting, uh, it's been a very interesting ride, but um, I've also been very fortunate with a, a, the, my teaching job here at Holy Innocence and um, wonderful colleagues and students and administrators that I work with every day. So, um, so that's in a nutshell, that's sort of all of the, the things that I have going on or, or my entire you know backstory of how I got to be where I am now. Um, let me actually ask this because you said something that about your history that really stuck out to me. Um, you said that your, it was your general music teacher who, who saw the potential there. Um, who was it who saw the potential for the composing? Was that then like you were in the band, you were playing an instrument or was it like continued experiences in general music that gave you those opportunities? So it actually was because we started band in the fourth grade. Um, my general music teacher, whose name is Marjorie Lee, um, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, it was at Valley Intermediate School. She um, she was the general music teacher. We were working on recorders, as you do, you know, hot hot cross buns ad nauseum, um, and um, <laughs> as you do. And she very quickly realized that I had a pretty good ear and would figure things out on the. Um, on a recorder. And so, but she's also was the band director at this elementary school too. So band met after school um, from about two 30 to three 15 every day. And so it was an after school commitment as a fourth grader. And, um, and so after I started in band and I started to really dive deep into, you know, actually re- how to read music uh, for me, it was very quickly. I also realized that I liked playing my instrument. I love practicing but I also liked practicing um, songs that I couldn't have access to at the time, um, or I could not find the sheet music for. This was before internet was as well as it is now. I mean, we still sure. had the internet, but as a fourth grader, I didn't know how to use it that well. And so I remember like if there was a football fight song or a TV, a cartoon theme song that I wanted to play, I would just turn my music over from, from band class and I'd write five lines out and I would try to write it out. And I would play through and if it wasn't accurate, I would try to make an adjustment and just kind of trial and error. And it wasn't until I started doing that my fourth and fifth grade year. When I got into my sixth grade year, I went to middle school. Um, I actually, I should mention though, I really had a a spark as an interest in conducting uh, in those, that fourth and fifth grade year. I remember going up to the teacher and asking her, begging her if I could like lead the B flat scale. For one day and it was like you i was like i won the lottery the day i got to do that <laughs> and it just it lit a fire in me to want to conduct and it's i've been doing that ever since when i was in middle school i that was a really encouraging coming from um my middle school band director amy moore um if there's any band directors here who's played ash and stone or at twilight those are both pieces that i've dedicated to these two outstanding educators that are the really responsible for getting me where I am now and getting me started. And I was also part of a youth orchestra program and it really was um, a combination of my own band director and also this youth orchestra that I was a part of um, outside of school that where I, they would let me 
try my pieces out sometimes they would pass it out to the band or if we had a couple you know if i wrote a clarinet trio then we'd pull three clarinets in or um you know i'd write a really bad orchestra piece and this orchestra was you bless their hearts they they suffered through it and they let me you know learn a lot and just trial and error and so that was really where a lot of that composing sort of began it was very much self um it was very much self uh self-started uh, however now i'm very uh, active, especially during these current times to get my students composing and think about their creativity as well. And I've been very surprised at what my students have come up with. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it, I think it's definitely a very important thing that we all should be finding ways to incorporate into our curriculums um, to not just to read the music, but also be able to write it as well. If they're going to be really musically literate. Yeah, good segue, because that was my other question, which is, so lots of teachers are, are rethinking, you know, for those of us who have moved hybrid or fully online, we're, you know, we are thinking about, you know, are there better ways to spend our time than rather than, you know, being, um, you know, you know, like a spin spin class for instruments with play along tracks and concert rep, which yeah. certainly is, like I told you earlier, is a part of what I'm doing. But, but, you know, are there other things we can be supplementing with that do actually work really well online, things that use... Um, you know, like things like using composing tools and, and being creative and writing more music and producing. How much before the hybrid model and now currently with the hybrid model was composition a part of the, I guess I'm going to ask, you can answer it broadly, but I guess I'm specifically curious about your band classes since they're more of a performing ensemble kind of thing. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, it's interesting. I only had uh, one, two, three. But is it six months? Yeah, no, six or seven months with my students before the pandemic started. Because this again, this is my only my second year at this in this position. Um, but and so before then, I did, had not actually had a chance to work with my ensembles on on this yet. Um, and so and there's there's a lot of things that we've already started changing as a part of the curriculum. Um, that we were planning to change before the pandemic even started that incorporated more, you know, reading rhythms and making sure that we can read our, our rhythms and, and form measures that have the accurate number of, mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of beats in it and, and counts and everything. And so the, and so beforehand, it really was not a thing. However, I also get emails a lot from band directors who are saying, what should I do for my student who is com interested in composing and what should, what, what should I tell them? What, tools should they be using? And that's when I would say, oh, well, of course, you know, GarageBand and NoteFlight and, and MuseScore and all these different, you know, free applications that they might have access to are wonderful. And so now in the middle of the pandemic, that was an avenue that I was very excited. And even my, my students decided to jump down, which is getting them actually creating something. Uh, for some of them at first, it, they were very skeptical and they were not entirely bought into the idea. But you know, I, I often made the the analogy to you know, English class that they they shouldn't not only just be able to read a book, but they should also be able to. And we teach them to write a paragraph or write a paper, um, you know, write poetry and do all these different things. That's not just just reading it, but also creating it with it as well. And I'm pleased to say that through a couple of maybe a couple bad weather days, we've just turned them into composing days. And I will give them a prompt. At first, I would just give them a really silly prompt. And they would, and for my middle school kids, they would just run with it. Um, and, but there were some of them where I just, I get, kept it a little bit more um, open-ended and let them really create something. And, and there are, are students that, even my high school students, that really poured something really beautiful out into a thing. And, and what's amazing is once they start le learning some of these programs, they're interested in actually expanding the number of instruments that they're writing for. I, originally, I would say that you only have to write a piece for, you know, your instrument um, and write, you know, 16 bars and give them a few parameters using some of the other terms that we've used uh, in class or like, you know, phrases and sub phrases and all those different types of things. But what I've, what I've been interested to see is that they go above and beyond because they want to, they like creating texture. They love exploring these different sounds and trying to create with them. And so, and a lot of that came from even when I was doing my general music class and just watching these students really explore these different things. And it almost became like, you know, it's very, just very much like a child's play kind of thing. They really were just seeking to discover. They weren't just trying to, um, to just make nonsensical sounds. They actually were exploring and they used it in an actual piece of art that they created. 
it's so interesting the opportunities that we are afforded now I, and i'm i'm just now scratching the surface with what might be possible in our second semester you know i, I am meeting with our we're, we're split two semesters so i've got all of our we, um we we decided to put both of our younger bands in the first half of the year and i actually and what's cool is this is just a side note it's not relevant to the question but it, um what's cool is that i've took all the brass and percussion and then my uh the other director at my school took the woodwinds which is just not a way we've split the younger classes before and that's been kind of an interesting experiment um but we have been meeting once a week during uh with sectionals with our advanced students who don't officially take any classes until the spring and yeah. um one of my you know i'm kind of introducing them to the tools that our district bought for us we got soundtrap we got note flight flip grid we already had it but you know we're i'm using it a little bit more than before and i'm introducing yeah. them to some of these tools and uh from one of my flute players i get an email well, not an email, but like a, you know, Soundtrap will like notify you. I have, I think I have the web browser set to like, you know, Chrome will like be like, you know, this student has sent you a thing. And so I, I open it up and it's named, uh, B- Billy Eilish. I, I feel old. Is it Billy Eilish or Billy Eilish? Um, I feel like it's Billy Eilish, right? I think it's Bi- Billy Eilish. I, I have my, I had, I had my students debate this when we did our, our pop, uh, uh, popular music, um, uh, units and so so yes uh billy eilish i think is so so favorite. it's the title of the of the soundtrack project that she has shared with me is like billy eilish song or you know something kind of, kind of generic but um yeah. I, you know i click the play button and i and i don't you know soundtrap doesn't like it will let you preview it with a little play button before you actually see how the tracks are all laid out so i just you know from the main screen of soundtrap i just preview the, the thing and it sounds it's like this 30 second clip of like four part uh, this like kind of chord progression that's all sung in ooze in like, you know, about four parts. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. She must have like sampled it from the, a track that I've never heard of before and like just was experimenting with dragging and dropping MP3s. So we're in our next flute sectional and she's like, did you open my song? And I'm like, well, I previewed it. It was really cool. Did you like sample that? And she's like, no, I, I recorded that. And I'm like, what? So... <laughs> So I go and I open it. She's like by ear picked out all the different vocal lines of this clip of this song and has like sang them track by track. She's multi-tracked herself. She did all of it by herself. I, all I did was just show them how to open Soundtrap. That was as far as I got. Wow. And so today in our sectional, she's like, hey, can we play the theme to Howl's Moving Castle? Which, are you familiar with that? That movie? Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, not really. Sorry, I, I'm not. I can't. I can't even pretend to lie on that one. It's okay. Um, well, I'll just. I'll say. I don't know if you're like uh, into like um, the, any of the streaming. I know most people have Netflix, but if you do happen to have um, any access to HBO, currently all of these um, there's. It's from Studio Ghibli, which is a, okay. a famous Japanese animation studio. These movies yeah. are like really well loved. I, I I'm speaking like I'm like. I'm being like super esoteric right now. I'm making myself seem really cool that I know about these. My wife and yeah. I just started watching these like two months ago because they went on HBO. That's awesome. But they but they have great they have great soundtracks um, and they're very beautiful. It's just a totally different animation style than what was happening during that time, um, elsewhere. So anyway, so she's like, "Can we play the theme?" And I'm like, "Well, I know that the music from that movie is is pretty good, but I you know." And I'm now I'm showing them JW Pepper and explaining like arrangements and things. And she's like, "Okay, yeah, I'm gonna try to." you know, here it is. I found, I found one on JW Pepper. It's of course for piano. I said, okay, so Mm -hmm. like we, this is the instrumentation of a concert band. And she's like, yeah, I'm going to try to arrange that I think for band. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, well, here's no flight. And then now we're, you know, that was a long story. But the point of it is like, I, this is a creative tick that I would have never seen from this student. If we were just smashing down fingerings to scales every day in band. And um, I think it's cool. I mean, I think it's especially awesome that you're nurturing that and exploring what that looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been a very, it's been a great thing for our students and, um, and it's something we're going to definitely continue post COVID, whatever that looks like. Whenever we, when I say post COVID being that whenever we are able to get closer to normal, whatever that looks like. Sure. In a, in an infinite time scale, I guess it's like, it, it's yes. funny. I, I know what you mean. It's like, people say like, Oh, well, when things return to normal, well, like things aren't going to just like snap back to normal. <laughs> no. It's, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be, it's been gonna be a long while for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's super cool. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned that you are, you have your own publishing company and yes, you are doing a lot of composing and self publishing. I, I guess I, I don't want to like get too deep into the mechanics of that, but I guess part of like where I feel like some of the topics that this show discusses and what you're probably doing with that is like, I'm, I'm super interested in the tools that make people creative and productive. And 
I mean, before we go on a huge rant on like what kind of software you're using to compose and to teach, I mean, like, is there anything that you've learned through starting, like just through exploring business that's helped to make it easier for you? As in, when you say exploring business, do you mean like, um, like, like, just like, are there any businesses that I model after or just like, or uh, things that I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I've, so I mean, I guess what's consistent amongst most people who I talk to who do like more than, you know, one, like, because there are people who certainly are excellent mm-hmm. band directors and there are people who are excellent composers, but people who are deeply curious and tend to be very, very invested in more than one thing. I find that those are also people who tend to not um, recognize limitation. And so often these oh. people will find out the way to get to where they want to go. And sometimes that introduces tools into their life. And that's being a technology, you know, being someone who's interested in technology, I always try to find out like, what are some of those tools that have helped you and made what some people I feel like would not want to do, which is (laughs) self-publish. What are some of the things that (laughs) enables you to, you know, get there? Well, you know, mentioning kind of what you mentioned there, I think the biggest thing for me has been I'll say the biggest thing is, is actually having, um, obviously I, I, I currently use Sibelius. I'm in the process of learning Dorico. Those are the two notation softwares that I'm currently, uh, in between. I mostly use Sibelius and have for over, uh, 14 years. And so it's, you know, so that's the one like that I know, like the back of my hand. Um, however, you know, of course I, I use that for composing, but it has been incredibly helpful for, uh, writing up exercises for our ensembles. Or if there is, um, you know, we've had a couple instances where, you know, there's been an opportunity at our school for uh, two um, elementary school um, trumpet players to play for a chapel service or play for an, for an elementary school assembly. And they just want a little trumpet fanfare that's 15 or 16 measures long. And so having access to a notation software has been great to just be able to, you know, crank that out really quickly. And you don't need to be a professional composer to be able to do something like those things. Um, I think there's a lot of us that um, actually, now that I think even more specifically, something that I learned from actually when I was student teaching that I currently uh, love is the idea of rhythm and melody sheets uh, for a piece that you're playing. So um, for example, if we're playing Moscow 1941 by Brian Balmagis, then I might write out that in, that melody at the beginning uh, in all of the parts so that we can all learn exactly what that's going to sound like and open our ears up to hearing what that's going to be and, and recognizing it when it's happening in a section around you. Um, so as far as teaching tools, that's been really great to help supplement our, our curriculum. But as far as other things too, um, it's going to sound super basic, but I ran, I still run most of my business just using Google Docs for invoice management and data management and all this kind of stuff. Um, And I wasn't necessarily using a lot of that for our band program. And by the necessity of of COVID and and all of the moving parts we have in our program now, uh, our entire program is digitized onto one, um, you know, one Google Drive that if uh, I tell uh, my assistant band director that if, uh, you know, if I were to get COVID or get hit by a bus or something, all he needs is the Google docs and he knows exactly where everything is and what has to happen and what the schedules are and who's in what class and, um, what instrument every kid is playing, um, when the last time they got a parent email, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, or a a follow-up email. I mean, it's incredibly detailed. And so those are some basic tools I know that have, um, that I've, I've had to learn to use over the, over the years, but has just been incredibly valuable to us as of late during, during COVID and even before that too. They're basic tools, but they're tools that you can do a lot with, like they go in depth when you want them to. And I mean, as a, someone, someone who's composing, you mentioned the switch of Sibelius to Dorico, which has been covered on this show before. I mean, I, so I'm, I'm like your, the, of the two kinds of composing you just mentioned, like, you know, write in a piece for band and then like write in a worksheet. Like I am fully, like I haven't done any composing or arranging in for like probably 10 years. So like I am firmly in the, I need to reconstruct this missing bass clarinet part from my score library now mode of score editing. 
Um, so like I am like totally fine to be nimble and like I jumped from Sibelius to Dorico a couple years back, no problem. How what is that like for you, like being someone who's just so deeply ingrained into all of the very, very specific engraving tools and buttons and knobs and bells and whistles of Sibelius? It, it, it's been it's been a challenge for me, honestly. And it's also normally there's never really a good time to do it because um I'm um, I try to not call it a production schedule because it makes it sound like, you know, I, I write music like a machine and I don't think that I think the composing is very organic. But at the same time, I also have to be, be very careful because for me, I don't want there to be any technical thing that I'm that's on the forefront of my mind while I'm trying to be creative because I need all of my mental energy to be going into, into the creation of the work. And so I've actually, I've put it up. I've, I've owned Dorco, I want to say for about a year now, and I still have not composed a full piece on it yet because I'm still, I'm trying it out here and there, but I, right now I can't use it and, um, and compose yet because I'm still using most of my brain energy to learn how it works. And, and I know that that's going to come over time. My really good friend, Aaron Perrine, who's a composer, he did the opposite of me, which is he decided to write an alto saxophone concerto as the first thing he did with Dorico. And he is so brave and I admire him for that because I could never do that. Um, <laughs> and um, and the, his music turned out really well and beautiful, of course. And, um, but but yes, yeah, so it, it's, it's been a definite challenge. So I'm slowly starting to do it. Um, and I'm also trying to re-engrave some of the works because the engraving features in Dorco seem to be a lot better um, than Sibelius in my own personal opinion. And, um, and so that's going to give me a chance to do that and retype set some, some things and play around with some of those certain features. Yeah, you've cut to like the core like of what I feel like this show is about, which is about finding like what are, what are the tools that make us more creative because they're, they, they're out of the way. You know, what are the things that... Um, or I guess like the Steve Jobs is what is it like that the computer is the bicycle for the mind? Like that's kind of yes. the the ideal. Yeah. And when you're switching to a new total mode of learning things, it makes sense that uh, there's there's like some hurdles that are in your way rather than they're like enabling you. Of course, the idea of learning a tool by like de- completely depending on it is also yes. valid. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, it is. It's just it's I've been too I've been too scared. And so. Um, I, you know, at some point I'm sure going into 2021, I've promised myself I was going to try to just ditch Sibelius and, and go right into it and start composing with Dorico. And, um, and so I, I, you know, we will check back in later and see if I've actually yeah, made yeah. that decision, but, uh, but yeah, it's coming. Right on, right on. Yeah. It's interesting. Like I, I always am trying to find what's the lowest barrier to entry. And because I'm just doing such simple things, yes. um, a lot of these programs, I don't, I don't spend, like I'm transitioning in and out of them so fast that the, like the heftiness, like the, the weight of them is actually a deterrent. So it's like, okay, well, if I really just need to compose eight measures, do I want to launch Dorico? And I, you know, so I'm figuring out, like I tried, I've tried staff pad on the iPad a little bit, which is actually really, it's kind of cool to scribble out some stuff with a pencil and then have it you can do this thing where you like compose a couple of bars by hand and then it converts them to notation. Then you can like three pinch in with three fingers and it copies it. And then I can literally go to my Mac, which is a different device. And then in like canvas or whatever is my learning management system, I can command V and it'll like paste that perfectly engraved excerpt that I just like hand wrote from one device to the other. It's kind of magical and cool. It's um, amazing. It's awesome. But I'm just always trying to find like what's, What's the right tool? And yeah, it's, it's just, it's a thing. Um, but you said something in there that I think is interesting. Um, we, we, you know, we, yeah, we don't want the tool to be in the way because, because composing is organic. Like what are the things that you are finding inspire your compositions? Um, well, the, the, oftentimes I'm usually writing, I'm usually writing music for a specific ensemble that maybe has, has commissioned me or, um, I have a general idea in mind of, uh, of the ensemble, the grade level and difficulty kind of thing. And, and that, it really, it changes from piece to piece, honestly. There's, no, there's not really any one place that you go for, for inspiration because, or that I go to for inspiration because it, it, every piece is going to need something new. And that's part of what keeps it fresh and keeps it hopefully original. And um, you know, for me, I, there's a lot, especially when I'm writing for young students, I, I get so much inspiration from my own students. Um, and what I mean by that is also just the, the actual teaching a student how to cross the break on a clarinet. 
or, you know, teaching them, you know, finding something that gives them a chance to, you know, alternate between the F sharp and the F natural and learning the difference between the two and finding music that gives them context to really see that and understand that. And I, I really draw a lot from that. And, and whenever I'm writing for, for band students, um, otherwise, you know, I try to listen to as much music as I possibly can. I love my, um, I have Apple music and Spotify, and I just try to listen to different things. We did this, um, I had my students do an artist of your choice research assignment where they got to pick, uh, whatever their favorite musical artist was. And, you know, and they were, and they were presenting these things and I'm back there writing down these names and, you know, adding them to my playlist. Cause I want to learn, of course, more about my students and what, what piques their interest, but also just to know this music that I've not listened to before. I think having a lot of reference points for, for our ears and a lot of things that we're digesting at, um, as we listen, I think really helps um, soak a lot of music in that hopefully you can then make, you know, your own original stuff as well. Um, I'll also say that comes to inspiration or to start a new piece. Uh, one piece of technology that I have not had until very recently is actually Logic. And so what I'm now discovering is part of my process when I'm starting out or trying stuff out is, um, is playing around with the different patches on, on Logic with my MIDI keyboard. And, you know, if I'm writing something very slow, I might use a, a warm synth pad um, just to be able to really feel what those chords are and have them swell and, and decay. Um, or just use a basic piano. Or if I want to hear what something might sound like in a horn line, I can find the horn patch too. So um, having the samples kind of at my fingertips to just try things out, I think has been really helpful in allowing me to play more with these ideas that I'm constantly having. Do you use any third-party plugins or are you just using the stock logic? I'm currently using the, the just the, the stock logic. I have, I, I have a, my, um, as of last year, I actually up upgraded to the uh, new 16 inch MacBook pro um, maxed out completely. Um, and so nice. um, if I ever want to add any uh, third-party stuff in there, I think uh, I'm told that my computer can handle it. So it'll, yeah, um, more than, more than handle it. <laughs> Yeah, it'll more, more than handle. It'll do that and wash the car at the same time and do the right dishes. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, logic is definitely um, for me is like such a. And I know people are like kind of stoked a lot of people about Ableton Live these days, but for me, logic is the digital audio workstation where I feel the most musical. Um, I, I feel that same way that you feel. Like um, now, I, of course, I don't. I'm not a practicing composer, so I never actually like work anything out <laughs> but as far as a place where i can like yeah. it's like almost a, like a really powerful scratch pad for ideas um it is it is a place where i yes. feel super creative so yeah very cool that you're using that yes. um are there any Absolutely. influences from that your students pass on to you like that come from styles just vastly outside of the concert band realm that might surprise someone else that have like kind of seeped into your recent composing um I'm sure you can find ways that they've seeped into the composing. I, I can't like exactly give a reference of where that might be, but I know for a fact that my students have, um, I, before I became a teacher, I, I kind of lived under a rock and, and anybody who knows me knows this is the case. And when it came to my knowledge of sports was very little to none. Um, I also went to the University of Alabama and I really don't know how that happened. I really should know more about football than I do, but <laughs> I could not tell you anything about football prior to me becoming a band director. And, um, and so, and I, this is related, I promise, but you know, the point being is that there are a lot of things that my, in an effort to get to know my students and connect with them, I realized that I needed to know a lot of this and that I had my own homework to be doing at night, which was finding ways to understand and relate to what they are doing. And so um, of course, this is, <laughs> I say this about sports, but it's been directly the same tie to um, music and uh, movies and TV and different kinds of things there because these students do listen to music. Um, these students know what SoundCloud is. Um, I did not really, I did not know the full depth of SoundCloud before I started talking to my students when they said, hey, Mr. Grant, we found your SoundCloud account. And I'm like, what? I, I, have, I only use SoundCloud to embed my audio into my website. That's the only reason I got it. I don't right. really browse through it and I don't find music on there. But I've, when I started digging, the more I'm finding what my students are listening to, which are these um, 
you know, uh, essentially like, you know, music creator startups that are really doing a lot through SoundCloud and other platforms like that. And so um, they've definitely stretched my ears a lot and have um, given me a, a good reason to start listening to certain pop artists, you know, um, and, you know, whatever your opinion may be on whatever artist that is, it at least having some kind of reference point to that, I think is, is very important when you realize that you're writing music for students that are going to be, uh, that, that's what they listen to when they are not I and connection between the two, I think is, um, is very, very important. Yeah, for sure. Have you taken a stab at writing anything that, you know, there've been a couple compositions that I'm aware of that have kind of, um, played around with this idea. Um, the idea of embracing the limitations of Google meet zoom and trying to have kids doing something, you know, some kind of live performance that is designed you know, for I that. Perso- I, per- I personally have, um, uh, have not written anything that's kind of embracing the, the, uh, the, the latency of a zoom or a Google right. meet kind of thing. I I've, you know, I've definitely thought about it. The what's, um, what's both a blessing and a little bit of a curse with this given with these given times is my commissions are usually booked out um, several uh, several years in advance, um, and so you know for like for right now, my I have commissions I think that are on the calendar through about 2025. There are some there are some gaps in between here and there, so it's not I'm not it's not book solid, but uh, sometimes it's harder to spit a project in that I might really want to do if I know that there's an Allstate group or another uh, right. group that's commissioned me. Um, however, you know, I, I, like many, have done the flex arrangement uh, type of thing where, um, and you know, I really have to give props to FJH. I'm not sure if other publishers have done this, but I know the titles that we've done at FJH, you know, flex band arrangements that you can play with a smaller group of students, but they also are able to be recorded at home using something like GarageBand or any kind of recording software where the students can have an accompaniment track that they're listening to while they record and then pass the file to their friend in class and have them record um, and the, you know, the second part and the third part. And so you can actually do uh, a lot of recording from home and stitching it together and creating a multi-track um, as far as anything that's actually embracing the delay that we experience on Zoom and Google Meets and all those different kinds of things, I, I don't, I don't currently have any works for that. Um, written. Yeah. So it sounds like you're actually you've just already your year in composing was sort of laid out for you even before if you're if you're already booked to 2025. What um, yeah, I mean like, okay, so it's your second year at this teaching job. Um, yes. I remember my first year teaching. And there was no, and I, and I'm like, I'll toot my horn a little bit. Like I was an above average competency for a first year teacher. Like I felt pretty confident with myself, but I, but I, but no first year teacher knows what they're doing. So like I was absolutely struggling with all the same things that every first year teacher figures out. Um, I was staying in the building till like 9 PM every night. So you had like (laughs) this, you know, March of last year on top of the first year teacher's experience and composing on the side like how would you describe to someone how you balance these things together um well again the people that i work with in our our school um it's been it's been amazing to be able to have the kind of support that i do i I really cannot say enough about I, i of course i don't know if anybody from my school is even listening to this at the moment but really i mean truly the the folks in my department that I work with, the other two band directors that I work with um, and my administrators and all throughout our school are really just wonderful and have been so supportive in that first year and and now into my second year. And, um, and so, you know, for me balancing the two, it it really, um, you know, being in college actually taught me how to really organize my life that way. You know, that my second year of college, I think that year I took on too many commissions and I was taking a, probably a 21 credit hour load and trying to, you know, somehow stay alive. I don't know how I did it. Um, and I, and I just, it, it was, it got to a point where it just was not sustainable. I, I could not, I was getting very little sleep trying to manage everything. And it just really forced me to discover that I can't do that anymore. And it's, and that I can't be a good student at the time. Of course I was a student. Um, I can't learn the, what I need to learn. And I also can't write fresh creative music if I'm constantly burning the candle at both ends. And so 
uh, before leading into my first year of teaching, I, I felt really good about having those boundaries set up, which for me, those boundaries are, um, you know, really setting a time where I, where I know that I'm going to leave school and not stay until nine o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously the first few weeks of school, I make an exception because that is, um, you know, and there are certain times when you have to make an exception depending on what event is coming up. But, you know, I try to make that a part of my routine that I know that I will, you know, leave my office no later than 4.30 or 5 o'clock. It's usually maybe a little bit sooner than that. Try to get to work early to get as much started ahead of the day as I can. Um, And, you know, if I manage my time correctly, then I usually come home most days of the week. I won't say every day of the week. That's not accurate at all. Uh, with enough energy still left in me to be a little creative and to, um, to write. And so I treat my writing very seriously like that, where those hours that I had dedicated in my day, I would, I would treat those just the same way as if I was teaching a private lesson to somebody, or if I was having dinner with somebody, I honor that time. So a lot of it does come down to time management and trying to, um, you know, organize the tasks in my life. I'm a big fan of the remind apps and the, um, or, or the, the, the to-do list apps and the Google calendar and all those different types of things that help me keep everything really organized. So um, that's, that's been, that's been really crucial, but I also have, like I said, I have supportive colleagues who um, during that first year really checked in on me and made sure that I wasn't burning myself out. And, and they, they caught me at times where, you know, they could tell that I was burning out and I'm grateful to them for, for finding that. And so I, I really can't just say enough about how amazing uh, my experience has been at this, at this school during this, these first few years. And, um, and especially during these current times and learning how to improve my teaching while also juggling all the COVID-19 stuff. Yeah. Our, the, the whole current situation has almost made our music team feel more than ever like our central hub for all things related to the job. Um, even to the point where we actually are, are super fortunate that we are our own team now. I mean, like we were already a team and, and, you know, we would be referred to as the music team. But what I mean is that, um, like, we're not a part of a grade level team anymore. We have our own team meetings. Um, so, we're you know, we're we're super excited about that. A lot of, you know, support comes from them. A lot of ideas are shared through them. A lot of information comes through them. Um, so if you have a good one, uh, count your blessings because, yes, it's <laughs> for more reasons than one. Yeah, I'm, course, I'm super yes. grateful for my team also. They're the best. So mm-hmm. you can't mention to-do apps on this show and me not inquire more because I'm a super big productivity nerd. I am yes. um, all about, I, I use OmniFocus for pretty much, it's like my digital brain. Yes, well, well, I know for me, and I, I know you're going to ask, you know, which ones I use. I'll tell you what I use now. Um, just a couple of them that I'm trying out. I, I still am in this phase of really trying to figure out what it is that is perfect for me. So I haven't cracked it yet, but I found some that I really, really like. Um, and you know, for me right now, I, um, there's a whole lot of stuff in Google docs and, and what I mean by that is I actually put my, um, my writing calendar into a, um, in, in, I guess it's Google sheets. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I love to block out the months because I think of my composing not in you know days or weeks. I think of it in months because it will take me X number of months that I need to allot for a project. And I need to be able to visualize that on a gigantic scale um, right. and be able to look that far out. And so I will sometimes put things in Google Sheets like that. Um, I also, you know, the reminding apps or the, uh, what's, what is the actual name of it? Reminders, I think it is. Yes, in Apple. I have an iPhone and a, and a Mac. So Um, the reminders app, I have those categorized by school, uh, to do, um, composing to do publishing company to do, um, FJH music company to do, um, and then personal to do, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, which I'm glad I do that because otherwise I would not have known to buy groceries when I came home on my way home today. (laughs) Uh, And so, you know, it's just, it's, you know, keeping things categorized that way, I think is really important. Um, the other thing too, that I I've, I've been using and it's, uh, it's a paid app, but you know I, I think this this really applies to you know, practicing musicians or even teachers that are just trying to maybe lesson plan and block out everything else. And it's an app called Freedom. I don't know if anybody has uh, talked about this at all. No, but actually, it is it is a is a paid app that allows it, it it stops it basically turns the internet off on your computer for or your phone 
for a predetermined amount of time. Uh, you can schedule it as the same time every day. You can select apps you want to be able to still use, apps you don't want to be able to use. Um, you know, for example, when I'm composing, I want to disable all social media websites. Mm -hmm. um, I want to disable my email. I want to disable, um, you know, certain, uh, just certain notifications on my phone. Um, and then I can even, if I really am wanting to buckle down, I can set it to where I it will not take phone calls on my phone, except it's, it's somebody in my favorites list. Um, wow. and so, you know, or if I want to be able to get text messages only and no phone calls or phone calls only and no text messages, um, it, it's very customizable. And so I find whenever I'm composing or if it's, you know, the weekend and I'm grading, or if I'm trying to, uh, plan out the week and I don't want to be distracted and I can be very distracted. I'm, you know, just like, you know, most people who have the social media apps on their phone and can, you know, sometimes scroll around a little bit more than I should. And so that's been really great to just kind of keep me honest to, uh, to not getting on those sites. Does it somehow link to your actual Wi-Fi network? Cause I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how an app on a phone would have this kind of access. It, so you, you, you download the app on your phone and log into your account. Um, and then you have, you download the app onto your, uh, desktop computer as well. Um, it, it must be doing some stuff to your Wi-Fi network to kind of keep those sites from loading. This is really interesting. I guess, yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, it's, it is. It is fairly interesting. I can't remember. It was another composer who told me about it, and it's you know it's a content blocker, but not in the in the sense of um, anything other than just really for the predetermined amount of time. Sure, um, sure. And so it, it's also valuable where you could set it to where if you want to not have Facebook or Twitter or Instagram from ten thirty p.m. until six a.m. every night, and you're not waking up to social media all the time, then right. you can you know, determine it for that as well. I, there are a lot of things that also um, Apple devices have, are now integrated with. They actually have timers on certain things. This sure. one is just a little bit more customizable and works great for uh, desktop computers as well. What's, what's, uh, do they make it super hard to, cause I know like the thing that's on the iPhone, there's like a little five more, like if you tell Instagram only one hour a day, it'll be like, do you want an extra five minutes? There's always that button. And I'm yeah. like, <laughs> this one doesn't have it. This, this, this one does not have it, and, which is why you got to be very careful what you decide to, to select, you know, because if you are going to be without, um, you know, YouTube for three hours, you got to make sure you don't need YouTube for three hours. Sure. Um, or if, um, you know, if you block out certain callers on your phone, you got to make sure you, you know, if um, you have somebody in your life that, that needs to be able to reach you, you should probably make sure you, you think through all those scenarios. But, uh, but, I, but that's just been one I've been trying out. Um, you know, there's a ton of apps that are like that as well, that just kind of help productivity and, um, and, and band directors, I know all over can relate to this, where you have your to-do list for the morning, like right when you get there. And uh -huh. then, you know, it's like a fire goes off in your email inbox and suddenly you have spent the entire day doing nothing but what came up and you didn't achieve what you want to do. And so, um, and those days come and go and that, that's natural, but this is something to where you can if you need to block out certain things for a moment and really focus on what you're doing, then you can do it for small chunks of time. Yeah. The system that I use with OmniFocus, it's, it's a highly customizable to-do app. And the reason why I use something so powerful and customizable is has less to do with, because like teaching is hard enough and multifaceted enough. Um, I feel like it's the other stuff I also do on top of that that requires such a, a powerful tool because you're absolutely right. There are things, like I organize my, my teaching stuff to the same degree that I organize all of my other stuff, but, but it is definitely the part of my life where I will get to work and I'll, I'll realize like, Ooh, I had like a to-do list of maybe eight to 20 things and maybe could have gotten six realistically done. But now I'm actually spending every period like reconstructing a roster because apparently that deadline is sooner than needs to be sooner because of some policy change or something, you know, it's like yes. you, it's, it's almost just better to like have one, you know, if I can think of one thing that I get done logistically, that's not music or pedagogical <laughs> at work. I'm yes. pretty happy with that. Um, but composing, as you yeah. said earlier, is so different because you mentioned, you know, it's, you treat it like teaching a private lesson or, or having a, a dinner date, like composing is sort of free form. So it, you know, there, yeah, sure. You can like put in the calendar, I'm going to compose, but it is, it's hard yes. to commit to yourself. Yeah, it's, 
It is. And even, you know, a, a lot of the, the composers, I'm sure, who are, uh, may also be teachers at the college level or anything, like they're, they were a little bit more prepared for hybrid learning because, uh, or, or online learning, because they've had to learn about really, you know, setting these ground rules with yourself about working because yes, it is very free form, but you, you have to give yourself a structure. Um, I mean, it, I learned this very early on, even when I was in college or I would, I'll even say in high school where I would say, okay, all day Saturday, I'm going to compose. And you can very quickly convince yourself that it's okay to fall down a YouTube rabbit hole and mm -hmm. watch, watch cat videos and you're not getting anything <laughs> done. It's very, or, right. you know, now, now that I'm, um, you know, an adult, it's like, well, the, the apartment has to be clean. Like I can't write in a messy apartment and then, oh, maybe I'm going to look up some decor thing because it, you know, I, I would much rather pick new curtains than actually compose the music. And, and so, um, so yeah, various things like that, where you have to give yourself that structure. And I'll even say this too, to what you kind of mentioned, um, these fires come up in the composing world too, or at least in mm -hmm. me, where I think after school this day, I'm going to go and I'm going to compose and I open up my, um, my other email that I run all of my uh, commissions and, and my business through. And we realize that we need uh, a certain number of sets to go to this music conference. And I have to send tax forms to this school that I've done work for. And I got to uh, type up what I'm going to say for the Skype uh, presentation that I'm going to do the next day. And um, you know, got to proof the parts from that came back from the publisher. And, you know, there are times when, when that life happens too, where you can spend most of your time uh, just doing the administrative stuff and not actually doing what it is that your, your job is really is. And so, um, so I find that, you know, these things are, have all informed both the teaching and the composing, you know, there are practices for both that I, um, I have followed, you know, my, my, my cutoff time for composing every night is 1030. I will not compose past 1030 PM unless there's a really quick deadline coming up. But I know for me, I have to set that ground rule because if I don't, I'm not going to be rested to teach the next day. And so, and the same for, goes for teaching where, if, you know, if I'm at the office, you know, at 5 30, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and I make that a habit, then I'm not going to be able to be really rested at all, but much less also get composing in as well. Yeah. I'm wondering if you, if you ever experienced this, uh, for me, having different domains that I um, engage with musically and creatively um one of the sometimes there's almost like um like a bipolar experience where it's like when there's lots of like when there's i'm on the upswing and a lot of these domains at the same time i'm like overwhelmed with positivity and uh good good feeling and then when the opposite happens it's like well if i'm having some challenges in both my school job and maybe like with some of my private teaching and also like this show in my blog like which is not even something that's like really heavily monetized. <laughs> like yeah. now all of a sudden, do you find that ever too, where like things are yes. seem to all be going in one direction or the other and it yes. either like really lifts you up or brings you down? Oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, it's, um, oh yes. I mean, I remember, uh, yeah. I mean, just, this is a funny one. Uh, is, this is like, is, and there are versions of that that I'm sure come up in the teaching, in my teaching life. But even I remember um, having my first piece performed in Carnegie Hall. And I flew up to New York and I went to that concert and it was great. And, you know, like super high moment for me, who's just, you know, the band, a band geek from Alabama who just, you know, liked to write music and just have my stuff played in Carnegie Hall was just amazing. Um, and, and then to go back the next day and because I didn't sleep very well, I, I got a D on a music theory quiz. Um, <laughs> and so it's like, you know, it's like, you know, there's sometimes right. they're yin and yang like that. They're very much, you know, opposite type of thing, but but yeah, I mean, for me, having those two different things, um, you know, when they're both firing and going well, I mean, it's you're on top of the world, and um, and when there are those weeks, and it and it just is that way, where they're both just very much, you know, it's harder. It's, you're going through a hard period. It 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 yeah. It it takes a lot of energy to to roll out of bed, then you know that morning, and and you know yep. go back and try to make it better, but. Um, you know, the composing is such an emotional roller coaster by itself anyway, that if anything, it's taught me to recognize that if you're having that bad day, it's not going to stay that way. You, you know, I, I at least am able to know now that it, you know, things don't always go down. They, they have to go back up at some point too. And so, uh, so that's been really helpful too. I think that's my, that's such a, um, 
timely message. Yeah, it's just we've been it's just it's a very steady decline that we've been on for a few months here. And so I'm just waiting for us to hit the bottom of that roller coaster hill and, you know, start going back up again. Yep. So. <laughs> well, and some would describe 2020 as just one right. giant down. Yep. Right. <laughs> um, let me take a break real quick. I have I have to do some. F- I want to do a, some some follow up. There's two things I need to mention in this episode, and before I change the topic, um, so I've been lately. I snuck this into my last episode, like after the like recorded conversation. Um, I don't know know if anyone listens to that though, so I'm sneaking this into the middle of our conversation to make sure that people know this. So. Um, so I just need to say, so uh, there's one piece of follow two, actually two pieces of follow-up and follow-up is usually goes at the beginning of the episode, but I forgot. So my bad, sorry. Uh, so two pieces of follow-up. Um, um, I am, uh, for those who are listening, you may have noticed over the past couple of months that some episodes have sponsors. And uh, I wanted to just publicly say in the middle of an episode that if you are a director, a teacher, an author, you own a company that makes like cookies for people to sell at fundraisers. You have a technology product, an app, you're a software developer. If you're anyone who has any kind of service or product that is related to music education, um, that I am doing monthly sponsorships for the blog and podcast, uh, sponsoring the blog and podcast gets you, uh, an ad pinned to the sidebar of my blog, my podcast page, and my my favorite technology page, which is not part of the blog, but it's a popular part of my website. Um, it gets you a blog post about your product or service and an ad read, which would take place right now, but I don't have one this episode. So I'm taking the time to tell people I'm advertising my own self to say that if you feel like you have a product or service, that would be a good fit for an audience who is uh, deeply musical, very tech savvy, and always looking for ways to make their lives and their students' musical lives better, uh, please reach out to me because I would love to feature some ad copy of yours as a, re- a as a read segment on this show, as a written post on my blog, and to have people be able to see what you're doing on the sidebar of my blog. Um, it's uh, some people who have done it lately, Music First and Flat for Education have been recent sponsors, and it's been super fun to get to meet people who are in this space. Uh, those are both people who make music technology education products, but certainly not limiting my reach to just that. So if you're interested in that and you're listening to the show, please reach out to me. The other thing, and I feel like, Tyler, this will be, I'm curious for your, this, this is a piggybacking off of the logic um, yeah. thing from earlier. So I got a little bit, I went down the rabbit hole in logic back in, February. No, February. What is time? What is time anyway? Um, <laughs> like, like August, September. And I made my first ever product for performing ensemble directors. It is a, I don't know. I was just about to call it a CD. It's a collection of play along tracks that have justly in tune intervals to different scale patterns. Uh, some of which are like really similar to the ones in the foundations for superior performance book. Um, I don't, have any affiliation with them that needs to be said though no one has copyright on scale pattern so <laughs> i can tell you all that <laughs> if you if you use that book for your own personal practice of students um you these are um something that i made i made them in logic using the yamaha harmony director uh to make sure that um every scale there's like six or seven different scale patterns and they're all using super in tune tuning drones and they have trap beats underneath them and kids love trap beats and you know what's good about trap beats? They're not only f- super fun to play along to, but they are like the the uh, the the backbeat is like sl- like halftime, which gives them like a long feeling of a phrase. But then there's like lots of hi hat activity, which just helps them subdivide. I'm super bullish on the pedagogical validity of trap beats for practice. <laughs> Addition to metronomes. Anyway, I'm putting this here also because I keep forgetting to mention it on the show and. Um, those are available. I have a store on my website now. And if anyone is interested, you can get just the tracks or you can get the stems to the tracks to open in GarageBand or Logic Pro where you can like edit things. Like you can add your own instrumentation. You can um, make the count off voice, not mine. You can make it your own voice. You can um, like change, transpose it up or down an octave. You can add like orchestra sample libraries to it and make it sound like a cinematic experience. You can do whatever you want with these stems 
Um, I did I did a Thanksgiving sale. I'm probably going to do another sale closer to the holidays. So, you know, people can check that out. RobbieBurns.com slash store. Um, so I didn't prepare you to know that I was going to break here, but I, that's I appreciate you just going with it. <laughs> that's fine. Do you um do you yeah, that's good it's good do you um do much with play along tracks is that like do you ever make them in Logic or like adapt them yeah. to things your students are you know necessity is the mother of invention actually yes I've very much have had to do that this year for um, some of our you know more hybrid classes where we're recording them in their individual classes and actually stitching those videos together and we have a wonderful. Um, uh, technical director team at our school that has been going around to our ensembles and actually recording them. And we, att- we have attempted to do it without a click track and, um, or I should say I attempted to do it without a click track and they very quickly told me why that's a bad idea because, you know, I'm, I've never used a lot of this technology and realizing just the, the complexity of that. And, and so, um, and so I've been creating a lot of click tracks for a lot of the music that we're playing. Um, And it's been great and the students really enjoy it. And, you know, something that I've been, um, I've utilized even uh, in years past is having some of those, like a rock beat going on while, or some kind of like drum patch while there's a drone playing while they're, you know, doing their, you know, concert F long tones. And so it's, it's been very, very, it's been very helpful. And the kids really, you know, it opens up the kids ears and they listen a lot more and they are, you know, thinking about, the context of their rhythm and context of, um, you know, how everything fits together. I love drones so much. I, so, so one of my um, colleagues took my stems to these play along tracks mm-hmm. and he, I knew this was possible, but I've never taken it very far. There's a setting in logic where you can make all of the software instruments change their tuning system. So like, really? yeah. So he was like, okay, it's cool that you did the drone. You've got like this like 808 baseline and this trap beat. And he was like, well, I want to like add a bunch of string parts to it. So it sounds, so they have something to blend into. Yeah. Um, so he like put a, he made some things in the key of D and G and then he like went into the settings and he put it in just intonation and he, then you choose a key area and then all of the software instruments just snap to wow. being justly in tune. Yeah. There's like tw- over 30 different tuning systems that logic will play with the software instruments i have not explored that yet so i know what i'm doing after we hang up <laughs> yeah it's wild it's cool. really wild i'll have to look up if you get stuck i can i can look up where it is it's some one of this i don't you, you know how these apps are there's like multiple different settings pages absolutely cool well i want to like i want to make sure that we cover anything that you are currently passionate about i have like two kind of like um more segmenty kind of topical things i want to do but like you know you're the current state of things, your life as a teacher, as a composer, is there anything topically you want to cover? Um, <laughs> uh, we talked so much about it. I mean, that's kind of where we're at right now. It's um, the only thing I can think of right now is just that this year and, and, you know, and life right now for me is just, is so, it's just so different than it was before. And I know that's an understatement given everything that's happened, but sure. um, I know for, for me personally, it's just, it's been, it's allowed me the chance to reimagine things or look at things in a very new way, both of my teaching and my composing. And so, um, so, you know, to say that there's, uh, there's nothing really big coming up that I'm going to promote or um, you know, anything, it's just kind of, I like many people are just kind of, still absorbing what this experience is that we are still a part of and what we are going to need in the coming months to try to, um, as we come out of, you know, what is hopefully this very deep, you know, social distancing, quarantine, whatever you want to call it that we're in the middle of right now. And hopefully, you know, we'll start to see things move in a more positive direction here in the next, you know, year or so or, or more. And, um, that's all that I can really say is right right now you know my my day-to-day life is pretty much as i've described it (laughs) with everything else going on yeah sure well it's been cool to kind of just like you know i mean we've when we've talked more at length was with the when you came and um directed the regional repertory wind ensemble which is a a local group that i work with um and you know i these conversations were like kind of in you know while snacking in between breaks so it's good to like sit down and just kind of like dig in for a while of course. Um, I do. There are two segments. Well, no, I'm lying to you. There's one segment of the show, but I added in the note here and you didn't, you didn't contest our question this, this thing in here, but I'm, I'm just feeling kind of jolly and topical. 
I just thought as a fun December related mini topic, I would ask you, I was, cause like I've, I've thought about like one of these years, like doing like a, like a music and technology, like gift episode around this time. And there's yeah. really never been enough stuff where I feel like I could fill the time. I just want to know as, as a, a, a musician and a teacher, what is like the best and worst gift someone has ever given you with with the intention of like knowing that you're a musical person do you know what i mean like they got you a gift because they knew they were a musician what is like an example of the i mean you don't have to throw like a your aunt under the bus or something if you've got a (laughs) terrible sweater but like best Um, and worst gift so for me being a musician teacher you know band director what call you what have you uh one of the best gifts i ever received was actually um I can't remember exactly the author because it's it's on my bookshelf in my office at school. Um, but somebody gave me um, a book. It's kind of regarded as one of those uh, very uh, tried and true books of uh, classroom management and things to cover on the first day and how to do conflict uh, management or cl- conflict resolution and how to interact with parents. And that's just a major skill that I think was... Um, uh, you know, it was, it was talked about when I was in college in my training, but at the same time, it's just nothing can really prepare you for that. And so, um, you know, any of those resources, they're just kind of getting ready for being a teacher. Um, and then I would say the worst gift um, would probably be, and I, I mean this, of course, jokingly, but I, I have a lot of friends and family who know that I love coffee and that we have that Keurig machine that's in the band office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, and on the one hand, I was thankful that they gave me coffee, but at the same time, it, they gave me so much that I could, I could drink four and five cups a day. And, um, I became the energizer bunny and would go home and crash. So, um, I, I have to, I really have to tone it back and, and, um, have had to tell people not to give me any more coffee because, um, it really, it, it burns me out after, after a little while, but, um, some might argue that that's actually the best and worst gift at the same time. Um, but you could, you know, yeah, it depends sure. on, on how much uh, you, you aim to drink in your day. Um, exactly. My nutritionist. Well, you know, yeah. This time of year, I think we're all kind of running on fumes. And so we're <laughs> just trying to, you know, sometimes you need to have that extra cup just to keep you uh, keep you going. So my nutritionist says no coffee after 3 p.m. So I have to I have to listen to her. Um, but I should really, really have a meeting with your nutritionist because I have not always prescribed to that. And uh, yeah, well, it, it, you know, your body acclimates. But, uh, you know, I get super jittery even with more than one cup in the morning. But we got we got a latte like a like a like a nice we got a nice um, espresso machine back in the summer. Yeah, oh, wow. and, and yeah, like a like a like a really decent one. And I it um, I think, you know, so I've been I made a latte almost every day since really? then and um i think something about like the fat in the milk just like nulls the um the jitters because i can do i've been doing two yeah. of those some days so i know i know i That's makes awesome. me sound it makes me sound super old but it's like two two <laughs> coffee drinks a day. well I, I reached a point with my own students and 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 they'll tell you this where um uh, i it was concert week i think we had two i was doing an honor band one weekend or like both weekends and in between those two honor bands we had two concerts at school I mean, it was, it was just crazy week and I was not sleeping much and I just was drinking a lot of coffee. And, and I finally was having like a rehearsal with one of my sets of kids and they just finally stopped and they like, Mr. Grant, we can't understand what you're saying because you're talking so fast. <laughs> and, and it was one of those good moments where it's just like, okay, they, you know, <laughs> I'm glad that they love me enough to that where they, they're comfortable enough to, to sure. tell me that they felt that way. But um, you know, that, that's, it, yeah, it was very quick to become the jitters for me to just with everything going on. And so, um, obviously, you know, I've, when I realized that it, it, it's altering the, my ability to uh, speak publicly or, you know, sound like, you know, I know what I'm doing, then it's probably good to, to scale back. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And all things balance, I suppose. Of course. Um, I think my least favorite, uh, holiday related gift I've ever received that someone got me because knowing I'm as a musician is like every shirt that ever had like a cliche yes like like thing on it you know something like um ex- exceptional m- music teacher here just add coffee or yes. or like uh I'm a drummer bang badoop bop be you know something yeah. silly well, um you know what now that I think about it actually you know what I, the thing I can always remember was like those music shirts or the um, or, uh, you know, ornaments or anything like that, where 
it, you know, it, it says the lyrics are like maybe, I don't know, the Hallelujah chorus, but the music is like, I don't know, some Led Zeppelin song or something. Yeah. Where it's not at all what <laughs> matches. And so like, or it's in four, four time, but there's 17 notes in a measure. I mean, those kinds of things definitely drive me nuts. And, are you, have um, you seen this meme uh, that's been flying around the internet the past month of the, oh, uh, yes. it's like, yeah, it's like a Christmas yes. decoration and it's, we wish you Merry Christmas. This was, this was dealt with on the last episode of this podcast. If anyone wants to go, go back <laughs> to the show notes of last episode. And I embedded a, in the show notes, a TikTok of me duetting someone singing that melody verbatim. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I I forget what the tune is. It was like um, it was um, wasn't it Journey or was it? Um... Well, no, well, no. So that one is just like I think the the complaint with the actual real one is that it's just so it's not the right melody, but it is written correctly. Like all of the rhythms, fit, except for one. There's, so the, one of one of the jokes of it is that the word Christmas is on a quarter note. So oh. <laughs> so a lot of the the interpretations I've seen on the web have been like. We wish you a Merry Christmas. And, yeah. you know. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I, I have been that flow around for sure. Then there's, but then there's um, like the photoshopped ones. Like yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's some of them that have, have also like they play through and it's like, you know, some like, you know, Jong or something that's just not at all um, related. It, you know, it, but yeah. Th- those are always, um, those are always a pleasure. I, I, I don't think. You know, my students have never gifted me any of that before, though they email me whenever they find them, which I'm really proud oh, of. Oh, that's like, good. I, I, I wish I my students that. did that. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and so, but I definitely, I'm sure have a, a, a t-shirt somewhere that has, you know, that same kind of thing where the, the it just doesn't match whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. The, my favorite one is the, the one that's like, what's the, I'm trying to remember what the actual lyrics are, but the melody and baseline is that, um, that Usher song with little John in the back, you know? The yes. bump, bump, yes. bump, 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 yes. bump. Yeah, so good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yeah. It, those. Yeah. And 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 I just know that you know ninety nine point nine percent of the people walking by the store think, oh, that's so lovely, and they uh-huh. don't even recognize it. Right. So. Right. Uh, All right. If I if I had to choose my favorite, gosh, you 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 did even your second answer was was so legit i guess you know like I, when i i got as a sophomore in high school i got a, a marimba for christmas one year and that was like nice. the, the yeah that was like the thing that was like the next step for me as a as a young percussionist so it's like i guess and my mom is responsible for a lot of really really tacky shirts about me being a drummer yeah. and for the marimba so she gets to she balances herself out you know, she, she actually, she chips the scale for having bought me a marimba and all of my private lessons and a drum set and all of my gear as a, as a child. But, yeah. but I still complain about those tacky shirts when I get them, man. man of, course, sure of course, of course. You have to. <laughs> yeah. It's, it goes against your training. You have to. Well, we've already talked so much about music and tech, but every, every episode I do like a, like a short kind of just like, what's a random piece of music that you've been engaging with lately? And what's a random piece of technology that have that might not have fit into the discussion. I, I call this app and album of the week, but I certainly don't limit it yeah. to, you know, so many people don't listen to, I listen to albums straight through still, but some people like maybe we'll talk about a concert they've been to recently or a piece of music, whatever. Yeah. What, do you want to do app or album um, first? Uh, I'll do album first. Okay, cool. Uh, so for, for me, um, the album and it, obviously we're not talking about it, it can be any time period right like it doesn't oh, have to be this is like the most i love how diverse this segment becomes because yeah. it's everything like it spans so many different yeah. styles and so many hundreds of years of music making yeah so um so that album for me is and i kind of go through phases where like i listen to it a lot and then you know i put it away for a little while but i always keep coming back to it every few years uh, but there's an album it's um it's Leonard Bernstein conducting uh, the music from West Side Story. Um, and, and, and it's, he has these, at the time, I think it was in 1985 was when it was recorded. Uh, but I mean, he has Kiri Takanawa and um, Jose Carreras and a lot of really well-known opera singers at the time um, that really, it, it's just really lovely. But the cool thing is also there's a documentary on YouTube. Um, I'm sure you can, I'm sure maybe it's on VHS or DVD somewhere you can buy it. I don't know, but the actual making of that album. And so it's like an hour and 45 minutes long, but you're watching Leonard Bernstein interact with these or- orchestral musicians and these singers. And, um, and you know, it, it's amazing because there are times when um, you know that there are mistakes and you can listen into the album. And if you watch the documentary, you can hear, oh, 
that's the note that the Morocco player missed and he had to go back and redo it again. Um, and so, but it's just, the music is so great. And the singers, if you've never heard West Side Story sung by these singers, it's a completely different experience. And so um, I just, it's just, it's, it just feels so timeless and it just feels so fresh, even though, you know, it's, gosh, you know, what, what, what would that be? That would be 35 years ago that this was recorded. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so it's just really, really great. That, that's been an album I just, I love listening to uh, all the way through. I tell my students that the the goal is is to master the process, not the performance. And yes. it's it's interesting how that, how you've tied in that documentary, because I, sometimes when I have a piece of art that I love, and then there's some sort of like piece, piece of like media that accompanies it that gives that insight to the process. I sometimes almost love the thing that's about the process as much as actually yeah. listening to or engaging with the art. Um, yeah. You know, two, two other ones I'll even in that same vein. I mean, two other things that I also have recently found that I absolutely love in, in, in that same way. Uh, I know Taylor Swift recently released a documentary on Disney Plus or Netflix, one of those two streaming sites. That's kind of the making of one of her recent albums, which is very interesting. Um, and then there's also um, the, uh, th there's a documentary. I also am a, I love musical theater and I love musicals. Um, and, and judge me if you want, but I think the music from Frozen and Frozen 2 is fantastic. Oh, it's amazing. And, yeah, and so uh, there's a docu-series on Disney Plus on the making of Frozen 2, and it covers the animation, but it also covers the songwriting, the orchestrations, the music prep, the recording, everything. It's very thorough. Um, and so I love stuff like that with that accompanying, you know, video. But as far as like what I've been listening to, that West Side Story album just still just touches my heart every single time I listen to it. Have you, um, so you you must be engaging with Disney Plus. Do you, have you, are you into the Mandalorian? I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm slowly starting it. I'm still, I haven't watched all the, all the films yet. I'm, I have watched, uh, Star Wars four, five, and six. I'm about to watch one, two, and three. Um, I have a lot of well-meaning friends who have finally told me that I need to, you know, come into the 21st century and actually watch these things. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm slowly getting up to date on the Mandalorian. So I'll say like two or three quick things. Number one, you, if you've seen episodes four, five, and six, I feel like you can totally enjoy the story of the okay. Mandalorian so far. Um, thing number two is uh, it is like, Star Wars is hard to judge because everyone has different conflicting opinions about what makes Star Wars good. Um, Star Wars fans hate Star Wars. <laughs> so um, I will say that by most accounts and most people, um, the Mandalorian seems to have been a pass and a success. So most people seem at, at the least pleased with it. But the reason I bring it up is because um, Disney plus has a 10 or so episode miniseries about the making of the show. And it's, it's like exactly what you're talking about. Um, obviously, TV, not music, but it, it hits me in that same way yeah. where it's like, you see how the sausage is made. And I, and I almost love watching it just as much as the show, because you see like, yes. oh my goodness, they like literally, they made a room that's all LED screens, 360 degrees to shoot every scene in. And that's, there's no green screen. Like that's every backdrop you yeah. see in the whole show is like s screen. <laughs> it's yes. crazy. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, and yeah, it's anything that kind of, um, I think sometimes we, we romanticize the creative process a little bit. We think it's all like just this, you know, it's all fun and games and it's never, you know, stressful. And um, it, there's something about watching that Disney plus docuseries on frozen two, where, you know, they're having a very heated argument about into the unknown, which is just like this, you know, very sweet little sing songy type of thing. Uh, you would not know that there was a, you know, a, you know, people getting paid on, unknown amounts of money sitting around a conference table fighting about whether or not Elsa is going to sing a song or not. And you know, that it really is just in that creative process and the context that goes behind it is really, um, is really important. It's really important. And so, um, so yeah, I love stuff like that. I'll have to definitely check out the Mandalorian. Um, One of the episodes is about the composer. I want, I will really, really want to say his last name correctly. I don't think I'm going to be able to Ludwig. Uh, it's the, Grand um Garanson, is that it? He did um Black Panther. He's actually known for collaborating with Childish Gambino. He did the um that Grammy nominated record with him. He produced um but then he's done a ton of he's you know, he did since Black Panther he's been doing more movies. So he did he did the soundtrack for The Mandalorian and it's cool. It's like it's like very informed by a lot of modern electronica and hip hop and synthy stuff, but it's also, you know, he's got he's got some orchestra writing chops. So it's a kind of a hybrid yeah. of these yeah. Yeah. Kind That's of a cool fantastic. thing. 
I can't, I can't wait to watch that now. I'm, I'm, I love those behind the scene look at stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the best. All right. Um, I am going to cheat. I am not going to really choose an album. I made a playlist. I'll link it in the show notes. Uh, I blogged about this earlier in the week. Every time this year, I, it's just become a tradition. I read NPR's top 50 albums of the year. It spans everything from hip hop to classical to like music from places outside of the United States that I would never be looking into if it weren't for, you know, reading lists like this. And, um, I have for years now turned it into a Spotify and an Apple music playlist and then published it on my blog. This year is no different. Um, so my current listening is the top 50 albums of 2020 from NPR. Uh, if I, if I had to pick one album on it, that's been like this week, it's, uh, Leanne Le Havis. She's kind of like a soul singer and, um, and, ah, uh, gosh, can I describe this well? I mean, it's one of these, it's like a really, really well-produced album where the instrumentations are, like, everything is very, very groovy, but it's also, like, very understated in a way mm-hmm. where no one is being too flashy. Not even her vocal style is flashy. So, like, um, the the lyrics in the in the soul just kind of comes to the forefront. Um, it's it's really cool, and she's got a, a cover of a Radiohead song called "Weird Fishes" on it, which is just not really what you would expect from an R and B album. Um, and it's just like a really good arrangement of that song. And I don't know, I'm I'm just totally digging on it. That's awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, app app of the week. App of the week. Oh my! All right. Um, so for my app of the week, um, I this is maybe not something super revolutionary, but um, I've I've been uh, I've been playing around a little bit with um, the, I believe this is one that's actually uh, developed by UCLA. It's the U- UCLA Music Theory app. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. And so, uh, but it's great. It has, uh, the thing I found really cool about it, of course, it has um, uh, site reading for note identification. And this is more so for my students looking into, into apps and devices for them. Um, and it, it does great stuff with um sight reading and interval training, but also, um, I think in this one, it also does, um, uh, melodic dictation exercises as well. Ah. Um, and so, and, and, and so it's, it's been really, really cool just to go through. And, um, I mean, obviously I like to stretch my own, uh, melodic di- dictation a little bit as well, but, um, just giving kids something that kind of develops their ears for our students that are coming in and out of, um, the, the hybrid model, I, I include on our class page, I have a list of supplemental apps. And so this is one that is about to go on there just simply for our beginners who are in their first semester and who maybe were absent for the two weeks, uh, where we learned about, you know, reading, you know, a certain range of notes on the treble clef or, um, you know, various things like that or intervals and different things like that. That's that kind of thing is like, for me, I, teaching intonation and tone quality is such a huge focal point in the band environment that like, but those are two real, those are already two super, I won't, I won't call them subjective as I mean, tone more so is subjective, but I, you know, they're just, they're, they're things that, um, that are a little abstract to younger minds. You know, they don't, they don't have a, a correct answer to them. There's sort of a spectrum of improvement that happens over your musical life. Um, but I still try to concentrate on them as much as possible. Well, the challenge is like, those are just so such hard things to give feedback on online. Yep. And um, those kinds of ear training examples that where a kid can do it on their own, mm-hmm. I find are like a really good supplement to that kind of focus. Yes. Yes, it, yeah. it is. It's very much so. And, um, and you know, it, it's having that supplement, I think is just, incredibly invaluable. And, and I think is a, whenever we're talking about teaching remotely and where our time is very valuable to be able to go around and listen to kids and give them that feedback, this is something that will give them that feedback on their own while you might be working with somebody else. And so it will give you a clear assessment. It will give you a percentage. It will tell you how many you've got right and wrong um, and help you sort of figure that out, um, you know, as you go along and can, you know, work on it that way. So I think it's, it's really valuable to have these kinds of tools available. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, mine is completely, mine is really nerdy, but also completely trivial compared okay. to that. Um, I am going to, it's, you know, you could argue if what I'm going to say is even an app, but you could also argue if my album pick is really an album. So I'm going to go with um, my Christmas time routine that I have programmed into my phone. Okay. Um, 
Are you familiar with the, do sh- you know that shortcuts app that's installed yes. on the iPhone? So third party apps and Apple apps can expose things that they're able to do as like individual actions. And you can like drag and drop a bunch of like a string of things together and make it like a one tap thing. So you could say like text my friends, I'm on my way. Um, and then you can, you can create automate things. You can say like, when I reach this location, do this strand of action. So you can get, wow. I get kind of nuts with these. Like um, I told, came down here and told my, my smart speaker that I was um, podcasting. And then it like reminds me to turn off this annoying fan that's next to my recording rig. It starts a timer, which times how long I spend recording. It um, reminds me to, it uh, you know, like does it, oh, it, it creates the show notes for the episode, yeah. all sorts of stuff. So anyway, I've got a, a Christmas time when, um, and it controls some home automated lights and smart switches in the house. And then uh, awesome. turns, turns on Christmas. Yeah, you tap it once and then here's all the things it does. It turns off the lights in the main floor of the house. It turns on all the Christmas trees. Uh, it plays a Christmas playlist through the speakers in the house. And then I recently added a step. You can make a step of a shortcut to like literally open an Apple TV and open a specific app. So now oh my all of the Apple TVs when I tap this button, we'll turn on and the magic fireplace app will open. So I have like cozy Christmas fireplaces. <laughs> I love that. I, well, I love that. I mean, I, you know, actually now that I think about it, you know, I, I'm, I should use that. I mean, I, I do use, um, we have an Apple TV in our van room. And so every day, part of my thing is air playing a Google slides up on the board with our objectives for the day and everything like that. And, and I'm, I'm just now realizing based on what you said that I might be able to actually do something like that, that actually kind of, you know, executes exactly what I needed to do. Um, right. In yeah. Netflix. So I'm curious well. what you come up with because I want to use shortcuts more for work. I use it a lot for things that are, you know, so, so many yeah. of the apps I use for work don't have really good support. Like they don't build their actions into it. Um, yeah. but a lot of independently developed third party apps do so, but the, there are airplay actions. So you can say like a step of a sequence can be like, play this media. And then the next sequence can be like, okay, but now play it through this particular Apple speaker or this particular Apple TV. Wow. That's well, that's fantastic to know. Yeah. I hadn't, I had no idea that that was, that was a thing. I mean, there, there are, I'm still slowly discovering things. I, I'm, you know, my family says that I'm the tech guru, but in reality, I'm, I'm still fairly behind learning certain things, but, um, like I, I just realized, uh, that you can actually program tapping your Apple on, on the back of your phone to do st- like, if you tap it like that, I think I have mine set to do a screenshot or oh, something. Like everybody that. needs to know that. This is one, okay. So this is one of those things that, because I read like some of the blogs I follow are like, you know, the kinds of blogs that write about this shortcut stuff, like super nerd Apple technology blogs. So what, so yeah. I take for granted. Cause like I knew about that feature. That's a new feature, by the way, you're not in the dark oh, really? about that. That's yeah. Okay, that cool. came, that's an, and that's an accessibility feature. So, but, but it's one of those things where when I see it gaining traction in the mainstream, I'm like, Oh, I, if I had known people were unaware, <laughs> I would have told them. Yeah, so every, exactly. Every teacher should know this in the accessibility settings. There's tons of stuff you can do with your phone and you can program to double tap the back of your phone or triple tap. The back of your phone can do anything like pretty much like anything that the, you know, like open the camera app, uh, take a screenshot. Mine will open, um, a new like note to start typing. Like if I have to take a quick note, yeah. I'll like double tap and then it opens a new note for me. Um, but yeah, this uh, is you, not scripted whatsoever. I'm, I'm now thinking, I'm thinking I'm going to program mine to open up tonal energy. <laughs> that I is what like, like, I should be doing that. Like, that's just like tap it and then you stick it in the kid's bell, you know? <laughs> so, right. Exactly. No, I know yeah. music teachers who have done that. Um, yeah, no, totally a good use case. But here's the thing though, is that if you like f- fiddle around with shortcuts and you make a really nice shortcut, you can make shortcuts respond to the double or the triple tap. So, so you can have like, like my Christmas thing could be like a triple tap to the back of my phone could just literally like turn it into a a holiday wonderland here. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. This is, this, this could get dangerous. I I may just not be able to have to tap my phone three times and have all my stuff work for me. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's, it, that's incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm going to investigate all that for sure. It's a fun rabbit hole. Tell me what you come up with. I'm happy, happy to I share snippets. Have, I'll definitely let you know. Cool. Well, let me ask you this. Um, where, where 
do you like people to find your work? Are you on any social media? I know you have a yeah, great website. I'm on, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I, I, I currently don't have Twitter, uh, but I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I have a website, tylersgrant.com. Uh, that's kind of the one-stop shop for everything. If you're, um, you know, wanting to look for my work and see things that I've done with regards to clinics and conducting and commissions and all those different types of things. And you can message me through the website and it'll come right to my email and uh, be happy to email you back and um, see if there's anything I could ever do to help out you or your program. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'll put links to all of those accounts in the notes to this page. Um, Tyler, it's so good to catch up again. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a, uh, this was a pleasure and hope everybody has happy holidays and, uh, um, or if this comes out after the holidays, hope everybody has a wonderful new year and a prosperous, uh, 2021. Yeah. And you as well. Thank you. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to music ed tech talk. You can find the show's page show notes for this episode and my blog at music You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can also now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week and a newsletter. Please rate and review the show in the podcast app of your choice. It absolutely helps. And it'll only take a second and a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud at Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening and see you next time.